are now tuned in to the Meesey Muse Unplugged, a pop-up podcast variety show helping consultants along their journey to greatness with your host, management consultant, author, and blogger, Christy Lindor. Getters, welcome to the Misi Muse Unplugged podcast show. For today's episode, we will be doing a segment that I call AMAs Ask Me Anything. If this is your first time tuning in, AMAs are when I have the utmost pleasure of connecting with either a seasoned or a former consultant and they give you advice. Today's AMA guest, super cool. We had the chance to connect with Kofi Cancam. A little bit about Kofi. He is not only a former consultant, he's actually now a serial entrepreneur. Kofi's background is, is, is pretty remarkable. He is a Harvard graduate. Also, he has his MBA from Wharton. And in both of his businesses, um, and he'll talk a little bit about that, he focuses his services specifically on helping people get into top tier colleges and universities across the world. So I think some of the advice he's going to give on, you know, how to make the best of your application and your candidacy for schools, I think will be pertinent, not only for, you know, aspiring consultants, but also for, you know, seasoned or new consultants as well. So I think this will be a really, really great episode. Um, today's episode also concludes our Welcome Back to Campus series for all of my undergrad, grad, go-getters. So I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to drop us a line, Misi Muse Unplugged at Gmail, if you've got any questions, feedback, or thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. As a preview for next week's episode, we're actually going to do a, what I call a deep dive. So we're going to talk a little bit about project management. And if you're in consulting, you know, consultants primarily work on projects. That's like what we do. And in order to be a great consultant, you have to have great fundamental habits of project management. So we're going to dissect that. We have a couple of seasoned experts that we'll talk to next week to talk a little bit about project management, give you some specific tactics that you can use on your engagements. And so with that, let's get started. For today's episode, you're actually going to get a special treat. I have the utmost pleasure of connecting not only with a former consultant, but also an individual who is a serial entrepreneur. That's going to give us a lot of a lot of great information. So I am super excited to welcome Kofi Cancam. He is the founder of Admit.me and co-founder of Advantage.com. So Kofi, thank you so much again for taking time to connect with us on the Misi Muse Unplugged. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. A little worried that I can't live up to that introduction, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I think so. I think, oh, I, this is going to be fabulous. I'm just very excited that we've gotten a chance to connect with you. But before we get started with today's interview, Kofi, maybe if you can take a moment and introduce yourself to the go-getters of the Misi Muse Unplugged. Sure. So I'm Kofi Kian Kim, as Christy mentioned. So I run a company called Admit Me, which is kind of like a LinkedIn for college and grad school applicants. We help candidates get into school. We've been doing this for a while as an admissions coaching company via admitadvantage.com, helping candidates about 12 to 15 countries around the world every year get into pretty much top tier undergraduate and graduate schools, business school, law school, med school, et cetera. I am from upstate New York and Ohio. I'm a first generation American. My parents are from Ghana. I am married. I live in New York. I am not the athlete I used to be. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else is interesting. But I am a former consultant as well. So I worked at a big five consulting company coming out of college. I studied neurobiology at Harvard College, stayed and got a master's in education from there. Worked at a big company, big consulting company. Thought about you know what's next for me. At the time, I was going to do an MD, MBA. I decided to drop the MD degree for fairly comical reasons, including not wanting to be broke in my 20s you know, on grad school campus. And then I realized when I was in business school at Penn, Wharton actually was broke in my 20s on a grad school campus riding my bike around. So but that's basically the, my background, you know, in a nutshell. And I've done sort of different entrepreneurial ventures. I pretty much went to business school to become an entrepreneur or continue being an entrepreneur, a better entrepreneur. 
And my interest really is in companies and solutions in the education and technology spaces, both separately and together. But I've been involved in a couple of different things here and there outside of that as well. What an impressive background, Kofi. You talked a little bit about your journey of how you chose your major and, and decided to drop a degree program. And it sounded like getting experience within consulting. Maybe you can share kind of how you decided to go into consulting in the first place. And, and how did you make the transition out back to, sounds like your passion is entrepreneurship. So how did you kind of make that leap back out? So when I graduated from college, I saw a lot of my friends going into consulting. I really didn't know about it that much. It just seemed like it was a continuation of college and you got a chance to get paid. By continuation of college, I mean like, you know, you're building a great network, you're building a great skill set, and it's a great launching pad to something more. And my experience getting into it was, you know, I went to Ghana for the summer between when I graduated in my, in my first year of graduate school. And I was working with a doctor out there. And he was explaining to me that a lot of the challenges he faced were technological as opposed to just medical. There were logistics issues, like he didn't have enough MRI machines, he didn't have enough CAT scan machines, he couldn't get enough trained surgeons there. So it started really becoming, at the time, equally as fascinated with the business and operations of sort of medicine, as well as sort of the science of it. And, and over time, I realized that I was more so fascinated with sort of operations as a whole. It wasn't just medicine. I didn't just want to do that. And so I said, look, you know, maybe I'll get an MD, MBA degree. And I knew that I probably could get into a pretty good medical school. But I knew in order to get into a good business school, I needed to work for a while for the most part. And so right. I started thinking, okay, what am I interested in? I'm interested in building a great foundation, building a network, you know, traveling a little bit around the country, a little bit around the world, getting exposed to different things because as a science guy, in college, I mean, I was working with monkeys, I was in labs, but I never took any business classes. So it just seemed like consulting scratched or checked off all those boxes and would scratch that itch. And so I got into it sort of knowing I would leave, but intending to use it as transition basically, you know, into business school, which I thought would give me the foundation that, or strengthen my foundation to get back out there and start companies. Right. You saw that early up front and saw the window of opportunity to really connect in the business and offside of, of medicine. So I think that that is that was really keen of you to to figure that out really early on. That's just mentors. You know, I had I had fraternity brothers that I saw doing this kind of thing and older friends. And I just saw I mean, I made mistakes, too, but I, I just sort of listened and watched and, and asked a lot of probably dumb questions. I'm sure they thought I was an idiot. But. I you know, had to get the information I needed to make some good decisions. Absolutely. So go-getters out there, you know, what, what Kofi's saying is, is really spot on. I personally think there's no question that's a dumb question. I know sometimes people say that and it sounds cliche, but when you're younger, it, sometimes asking the right question, you know, can, can really actually make a difference in, in the decisions you make in your life, I think, you know, and sometimes that innocence pays off. <laughs> so I think, you know, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, like don't just hold off and, and not ask them for fear, you know, ask those questions because, it you know, look at what, you know, the, the path it's forged for you, which is great. I guess, how did you decide, you know, so, so you were kind of, you know, in, in Ghana, you had exposure, wanted to get into the business outside of medicine, went back to school. Like, how did you decide from there to then pivot and start your college admissions coaching services? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So for me, it's it's actually, it's a twofold story. One, I had been sort of doing this for a long time. So I grew up in Ohio. My high school was not recruited, was not a big sort of recruiting school for a lot of top universities. So I ended up going to Harvard largely because there was a woman from Cleveland, where I'm from, who went to a pretty elite private school, who came to my high school and basically rounded up all the, you know, the top 10% of the class, freshman, sophomore, junior, I think senior year. And she was black. I actually thought I probably was going to date her when I got to campus. It did not work out. <laughs> uh, but basically, said, you know, you should look at other schools. And she convinced me to help to apply, right? Because 80% of my high school went to college in Ohio or Michigan or Indiana and maybe Kentucky. And so I ended up applying. She knocked on every reason why I, you know, I should not consider a school like that. Like I wouldn't get in. I couldn't afford it. She told me actually it's going to be cheaper. 
you know, they've got so much money. If they want you, they can sort of give you scholarships. And so I was acutely aware of the fact that, you know, saved by, you know, a real ounce of a stroke of luck, I probably never would have found my way there. So even when I was on campus, when I would come back home, my mom would always have people on my couch that were good students that she was trying to convince to look for, you know, different kinds of schools and the ones that recruited at their various high schools. And so I felt like I was all, I've always been doing this. You know, I was an alumni interviewer for Harvard. I did, I live in New York. I did outreach at sort of minority populated schools in New York City for really talented candidates like that woman did for me. And so I knew that this was something I was sort of good at. I knew that I could feel innately there was a need for it. And it was something that I felt I could trade my background off of, right? So I felt like I could have an advantage being a minority male, having degrees from these schools. I felt like I could, I could sort of tell a story and I could, I could be a little bit more advanced than I would be if I didn't have those, you know, those background elements. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while. Just it only is kind of my passion, you know, trying to level the playing field, trying to help more people get the opportunities I got. And it just kind of turned into a company almost because the secondary note is, you know, there was a girl I was dating. It was getting to that time where I realized, okay, I need to probably get engaged or sort of get lost. And I started doing this on the side. I had a different company coming out of school. I started with another classmate, like a job training company. And I was doing sort of admissions coaching for a different company. I was basically an employee contractor. And I was doing that in order to sort of save money for an engagement ring. And then at a certain point, I realized, you know, I can do this better. I can do this for myself. And I'm interested in it. I linked up with another friend from school and we decided to launch the business. That is very admirable. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe a little bit lucky, but it just, it found me, right? I felt like it just, this is, you know, I also started thinking more critically about, okay, like what are businesses I can start where I can use my background? I don't need a lot of startup capital. It can immediately sort of make money slash be profitable that I don't need any training for. And this was, this was kind of it, you know, unfortunately. So this is kind of all I could think of. It was what I was good at. So I decided just to make a run at it. Yeah. So what would you say, Kofi, you know, surprised you in starting your, your coaching services, like, you know, company? Like, was there any surprises? Yeah, there were many surprises. I think I thought it would probably be a little bit easier. I think that, you know, I never, you know, you hear of like competition, you think, well, I can just kind of execute my game plan, but I never really thought about how much I need to sort of be aware of the competition and actually be strategic. You can't just go in and start executing. We did that and we started executing and making money, but we kind of realized we weren't growing at the pace we wanted to grow. And it's because our competitors were doing different things like, pricing differently, letting people pay differently, you know, having different kinds of marketing on the website. And so I was, I was unaware of how much as sort of a leader of the company, one of the leaders of the company, I had to sort of keep my eyes looking outward and ears to the ground to figure out what the industry was saying. I also, on the flip side, probably underestimated the power of serving one customer really well. There were a couple of customers that we had that we did a good job with. But, you know, they got into school, but we didn't really focus on super servicing them. And we started saying we need to start doing this. You know, a couple of them, we had customers that would give us six or seven other customers, right? And they had this, and I never really anticipated. We were, we were thinking so much about doing sort of online marketing and, and going speaking at events that, you know, we didn't think about sort of the old fashioned way of, of how people discover your business, which is from a trusted resource. And so I think really... It's almost like a band that plays like, you know, every concert matters, right? Because like right. you play a concert with people happy, those people go out and tell their friends and then they bring their friends to the next concert. And so I think just really living that and experiencing was really kind of shocking for me. You know, as, as you talk through the surprises and earlier you talked about kind of you followed your passion and this is what you kind of did well, but then you learned and, and were surprised at how understanding the competition was important as well as the power of really, you know, the remarkable kind of customer service. When I think about those, they really parallel consulting really, really well. And so, you know, given given kind of where you are, you know, you've been doing this for for quite some time, what advice would you give a younger consultant 
that's just getting started in, in their career, that's, you know, thinking about following their passion, whether that means, you know, being a consultant in a specific industry or kind of like yourself deciding to go off and do something different. Like now that you've, you know, you've been doing this for a while, what, what advice would you give that person? So a couple things. One, I think that I, I, a couple of pieces, I'm trying to think the most critical piece of advice. I think one, you have to be prepared for things to, you, you have to go in and listen, right? So listening means listening to your prospective customers. It also means listening to the industry and really making sure that you are not doing that anecdotally, but actually doing it in a pretty rigorous and robust manner in a disciplined manner. So seeing what your competition is doing, reading industry journals, talking to your friends at these companies, if you're working at a consulting company, looking at their cases, you know, reading their websites, going to LinkedIn and figure out who from your undergraduate school is working there that you can talk to. Really being disciplined about that and taking those kinds of things also to your, if you're going to launch your own business, whether it's consulting or something else, you know, doing that same kind of stuff. I think also when you launch your own business, expecting it to take longer than you think, you know, saving for a rainy day fund and also really beginning to think about in a way that I didn't, you, you know, when I started, think about funnel building. How many people, you know, do you need to sort of talk to? Do you need to be talking to at once? What's your conversion percentage realistically going to be? How much money are you going to make per person? How does that cover your expenses? I think saving money going in thinking it's going to take a long time but also being really acutely concentrated on metrics and not just thinking, okay, like how much money did I make this month? But, you know, that's really a function of how many people did you talk to? How many, how are you getting those people in your funnel? How are you managing those conversations? When are you asking them to sort of make the sale? I mean, those are like really important things that are really operational that sometimes enable a consultant, quote unquote, who's less talented, but better at those kinds of operational things to win over someone who's kind of better at their consulting craft, but isn't better at sort of managing the operations. Today's episode is brought to you on behalf of the Misi Muse, a hundred plus selected practices, unwritten rules and habits of great consultants, a book by Christy Lindor, written in the voice of a mentor, the Misi Muse provides insights on the unwritten rules of great consultants, a perfect read for new or aspiring consultants. Christy dives into her 15 plus years of consulting experience while sharing interviews and anecdotes from over 50 consulting partners and leaders that represents thought leadership from 80% of the top 10 consulting firms in the world. Pre-sale begins shortly. Sign up at www.misimuse.com. Right. Good advice. Definitely good advice. Another question before I want to, I want to go back to the admit.me venture that you've got going. But be before I do that, I want to, I want to close out on, on, you know, kind of the admissions coaching piece of it. I do it, you know, in, in, in my day to day, I speak to a lot of younger consultants that are always kind of in a crossroads, right? They're either thinking about doing something kind of, you know, similar to you following their passion and going out into entrepreneurship, or they're thinking about going to, to B school or doing some, some sort of kind of further, you know, higher education piece of it. Given what you've been doing in the admissions coaching space, what would you say is some of the common pitfalls you may see with someone's admissions application or, or the journey of how they get into school, especially if they've, they're coming with a consulting background? Like what would be some advice you would give to like that younger consultant that maybe thinking about going to like a Wharton or Harvard or another, you know, business school and given, you know, that they've had that consulting background, like what would you say to them? I would say a couple of things. That's a good question. Firstly, your job performance is really important. So a lot of times people are so focused on the next step, like what's after working, especially once they make the decision to go to school, that they're not focused on the here and now and doing a good job where they are. And so that can have huge impact in terms of, in terms of their application because maybe they don't, get, they don't get promoted as quickly. Maybe they, you know, their potential professional recommendation, which pretty much has to be from your boss. Maybe he or she sees a drop off in your performance. Those are, you know, it's really important. People think it's all about sort of just your GMAT and your grades, but 
the recommendations are hugely important. I've seen candidates who have, I mean, I've seen recommendations from some of these people's bosses and the people have literally said in the recommendations that, you know, they started sort of well and, you know, they're good, but, you know, they're not sort of as, as good as they used to be. So I think that's a huge, huge issue in terms of people losing focus and kind of where they are right now. I think secondarily, I think a lot of times people, consultants especially, are so worried about the fact that other consultants from their firm and from their firm's office, their specific office may be applying to school, that they're so focused on that being the only linchpin to getting in. And they avoid writing about sort of personal motivations for going to school, you know, personal motivations for wanting to start a company, things they do outside of work in terms of like, you know, showcasing really high level of leadership and showcasing an ability to leverage with education to help other people. These are the things that schools are maniacally focused on. When you have like 10 consultants applying from a particular office, you know, they're, yes, you may all have similar sort of work experience, but it's kind of all the other things, you know, that I mentioned that kind of weave the narrative as to why you're a really good candidate. I think then thirdly, and this applies to sort of all all applicants, but certainly consultants, is there's a real focus on everything they're going to get from the school, right? The connections, the entrees and the jobs, the potential for venture capital funding. The applicants write so much about what they're going to take, and they don't really look at it from admissions officers' perspective, trying to figure out what you can contribute. Because once you've sort of checked off the box of having like a good GPA, you know, a good GMAT score, your work experience being being strong, there are many candidates that are like that. You know, most top tier schools, like the ones you mentioned, about 70% of the people that apply are qualified, 7-0, and probably about 10 to 20% are getting in. And the schools are really thinking about, you know, how can Christy make a contribution from an academic, personal, and professional perspective, right? How is she able to articulate her passion for a school beyond just sort of the name brand recognition, the name brand value. So as an applicant, and consultants can sometimes make the mistake that they really just think so much what they're going to take and they don't think about, you know, what they're going to contribute. And that's obviously what an admissions officer, maybe not obviously, but that's what they're looking for when they have to select between, you know, seven or eight qualified candidates for every single spot. Good insight. So go-getters out there. It's, it's more than just kind of the table stakes, you know, the, the, the GMATs and the you know, kind of the, the GPAs, it sounds like it's also kind of, you know, what, what is it that you're bringing to the table from a contribution? But it also sounds like, what is your authenticity? You know, that's what I'm also hearing you right. say, Kofi. You know, what is, what, what, all the time. what's special about you? And how are you going to bring that uniqueness to the, you know, to the institution in a way that you, you leave it and, and create impact, right? Not only at that place, but also out in the world when you finish is what I'm hearing. Yeah, correct. And if I can add one more thing, which I forgot, this always happens. People think about business school, consultants especially, as the next job out of school, right? They think, mm-hmm. you know, you, if you ask a typical person, why are you going to school? I'm going to school to get a, you know, to go work for this company or get a job in this field. You know, you're getting an MBA. That's a 20, 30, 40 year, if you're blessed with a long life, 40 plus year career afterwards. So People lose sight of the fact that they need to speak about sort of their career, or think about their career in the context of, you know, short term, medium term, long term, as well as with regard to industry, role slash function, location and title. Like they just don't have that kind of specificity. They're so focused on that first job. Whereas if you, you know, admissions offices and career service offices at these schools have surveyed alums who are five, 10 years out and over 50% of them they're on their second or third job out of school. So it's not just about what you're going to do immediately afterwards. Schools want to see if you have that long-term vision, especially consultants, because a lot of us, you, have gone exposed to different fields. And so you should have an idea of kind of what you're thinking about doing more so than someone who maybe worked in only one company or one industry for three to five years after college. You know, with that, thank you so much. That was that was a really sure. good good insights. I'm going to pivot slightly. I want to, I want to go back to admit.me. I had a chance to connect, you know, to, to go online and check out this. It looks like a social network. Can you maybe give us a little bit more about what at admit.me is, is all about? Yeah. 
Glad you said that. <laughs> it is a social network. So it is a tool space admission social network. So we are trying to address the issue of there being too little advice for too many students. So if you just look at it from a high school perspective before I get to sort of grad school, high school to college, there are literally about 380 students for every counselor. And so what you're seeing is that You know, the average candidate's getting about two hours of admission support across all four years of high school. And therefore, you know, people that should apply to college are not applying to college. People that should apply to four year schools are applying to two year schools. People that should apply to two year schools aren't applying at all. And you see also one third of the candidates at four year schools within like a four year time frame are switching, uh, switching schools or dropping out. And so we set up Admit Me. And the grad school is just, it's actually even worse in some respects because for grad school applicants, oftentimes they're getting no support. Now, they're obviously, they've gone through one degree or they're in a degree program, but when it looks, when they're trying to make that transition, they have no support. They don't have guidance counselors, you know, in, for most schools, right? Most universities. And so what we're enabling people to do is build a profile like LinkedIn that has things like, you know, historical information, like your test scores, your grades your activities, you know, things you're interested in doing, and then forward-looking information, like what schools you're interested in, what you think you want to major in, companies or industries that interest you, where you want to live, and you build that profile and you get free feedback on it, like annotated feedback from a current student, an alum, or former admissions officer, right? Oh, wow. So that is kind of our, our gift to you. You get that, you know, you get that free feedback and then you can do things like, you know, find other people applying to similar schools, find someone who maybe is at that school, ask him or her questions. You can use tools like a calendar tool that allows you to enter the schools that you're targeting, and then it'll backfill all the things you need to do between now and the application deadline. So you can do all that for free. The way that we make money on that as a company is what you may not know is there's so many graduate schools that are looking for candidates like you. It's very expensive for colleges and graduate schools to find students and matriculate them to campus to the tune of, you know, a couple thousand dollars. I won't tell you the school, but there's a major business school in everyone would say is in the top 15 and they spend about $3 million to build a class of about 600 people. And that's a top tier school with a global footprint, okay? Because if they pay salaries, they have to pay, they send people to these graduate school tours, they pay airfare, per diem, hotels, and they have to pay, you know, marketing costs, you know, doing stuff online, sending mailers out. So, you know, we're offering a solution for those kinds of entities. And then, you know, if you sort of are inclined to get more help and more support, you can pay for a premium option like LinkedIn, or you actually could say, you know what, Christy gave me great feedback. On my profile, I want to buy time from Christy to get help with different parts of my application, you know, brainstorming my essays, fixing up my resume, helping me prepare my recommenders, giving me a mock interview, et cetera. So that's kind of what we're building. What's intriguing about that model, Kofi, is I heard you describe it. I don't think, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I don't think I've ever really thought of kind of the the business school admissions process from the institution's perspective and the amount of, of, sounds like not only funding, but level of effort they do to find kind of quality candidates. Yeah, that's surprising. That's very surprising. Because I would think like, especially if it's the top, you know, when we start saying the top 10 or top 15, usually I thought, you know, people were, you know, running to them, you know, they they had like the opposite problems. I think that's, it's very intriguing to hear that. So some of it is people might apply to a couple of different schools. If they get into those schools, they always go to one school, right? So let's just pick a, pick schools. Let's just say, let's say someone applies to, let's say, a Harvard, a Virginia, and a Georgetown. Those are all really good schools. If a student applied to all three of those schools most, and got into all of them, most students would go to probably Harvard. And the question is for really top-tier schools like Virginia and Georgetown, what do they do? Right? How do they? So, how do they get students? To, yeah, you might get students to apply, but how do you actually get them to put their boots on your mm-hmm. campus to actually matriculate? And then you've got to think about globally. How do you get students, you know, to apply? You know, if you're in the states and you want to recruit a candidate from from Ghana, 
Are you going to send someone to Accra, you know, to recruit these students? How are they going to find you? Inherently, some of the students that find you, there's a little bit of bias because those students are probably well-to-do. They have some kind of exposure, you know, overseas to even know that sort of there's, they know there's a path for them to get to your campus and they figured out the path and figured out the timing. But there's so many other talented candidates who get tripped up on maybe one or two of those elements, right? And then you have to add in the other framework of what about women? Business schools want more women. You know, if you look at decisions made in families for purchasing, there's no shortage of studies showing that women are often making those decisions. But if you look at corporate America and who's making these decisions, a lot of times it's males. And that doesn't add in the lens of like, of people of color who are sort of, you know, who are going to be the dominant group, you know, Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, African Americans, et cetera. Asian Americans in the States in the next like 50 years. That's not represented. So these businesses are saying, my business can't grow unless I have different kinds of people in my pipeline. And they're looking to schools and saying, who do you have here? Like, where are the people that I can hire? And the schools are saying, oh my gosh, I need to go out and find these kinds of people globally, women, people of color, people with certain skill sets in order to satisfy my boss as a school, the, the corporation. So it's kind of this interesting value chain. So actually going back to the admit me platform that you just talked through, like once like a person, you know, decides they, they want to use the site, they set up a profile, how long does it typically take on average? Have you seen for users to start to kind of, can you know, get connected into the community, start getting that feedback? Like how long does that typically take that you've seen? We're cutting it down, but the feedback now that you'll get a feedback within a day and a half. And we're trying to cut that down so it's a couple of hours. I and mean, we're still a startup in that sense. So probably by the end of the year, it'll be a couple of hours. So what happens, you build a profile and then you can, you know, you can noodle around. So, so a couple of things. So I'm saying this in the context of you actually getting feedback on your profile. Like if you went on, right. you created, created a profile, you then can try different things, read articles, reach out to people, maybe your peers, reach out to experts you know, use a calendar tool, you can do all that, you can accelerate sort of the interaction. But if you just created a profile left, you know, I'm saying you would get an alert within a day and a half saying, you've gotten feedback on your profile, and then you log back in, you can see almost like and they're almost like sticky notes on your profile. So that is what takes right now a day and a half to we're cutting down to a couple hours. But if you get on there, you create a profile, and you start reaching out to people, you'll get a response. I mean, there are people on the platform now, you get a response back within you know, five to 10 minutes, people interact. Hey, go-getters. Have feedback on today's show? Questions on consulting? Want to be a guest? We'd love to hear from you. Just drop us a line at mecmuseunplugged at gmail. That's mecmuseunplugged at gmail.com. You can also show us your support by downloading episodes, spreading the word to friends and family, or leaving us a review. Remember, Misi Muse Unplugged is a pop-up podcast, which means we'll stick around as long as we continue to hear from you. Thank you for your support. Now back to today's show. My last question for today's interview, I you know, was doing a little bit of research online, Kofi, and I, I came across the fact that you have paid off your student loans. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. I know that actually that alone calls for a round of applause in and of itself. I know that a lot of people, you know, whether they're still in school right now or they are been in their career, I know I'm still paying off, you know, some of my student loans. So how'd you do it? Can you give us a little insight for those of us that are still on the other side of the fence? Like any tips? I will. Well, firstly, get old because <laughs> I'm sure I'm older than you can So that's, that's the first tip. I think a couple of things. So I think, you know, obviously being disciplined, paying off as much as possible. I lived like a pauper you know, in business school, my girlfriend at the time became my wife, did not love it. Didn't love when we lived like a pauper. We lived like paupers when we graduated, but we saved money. So we lived in a very cheap apartment. We could have afforded an apartment that probably was 60 to 80% more than we were spending, but we were, we were both trying to knock off our loan. She also got her MBA from NYU. So that was important for us to save money in that sense. I also took some calculated risks. So one of the things that I did, and this is actually recordable, you know, you can actually do this, is, you know, I 
was able to pay off these loans and just knock them off in one fell swoop after years of sort of paying them off. I was able to sort of write a check for a low six figure check to pay off the balance of my loans because I was involved in a startup company that I did not found. Well, I was there pretty early, but I wasn't the CEO and founder, but it was just one of my sister's classes. My sister went to Harvard Business School and one of her classmates was interested in starting this travel company. And the company went out and raised a bunch of money, you know, like millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, actually. And I basically reached out and said, look, I want to sell some of my shares in order to pay off my loans, right? And so the lessons, the lesson from that that you can replicate is you have to network with different people in your business school class, right? Or in your college class. And you have to, you know, just because you're working a certain job doesn't mean you can't have a taste or do different things entrepreneurially via supporting your classmates, maybe writing a little bit of a check here and there, a thousand, two thousand hours if you can do it, or just giving your blood, sweat, and tears. I didn't write any check for this guy. I just like was working 15, 20 hours a week with him on top of my current job. And I ended up sort of, sort of saying I need equity. And that's what enabled me to do that. Okay. So there's an element of sort of just being disciplined, saving your money, but it's also being opportunistic and taking risks, you know, taking some risks, especially when it doesn't involve a financial investment, but an investment of your time and getting equity for it such that you then can sort of, you know, maybe sell off some of that equity and pay for your loans. And I'm not the only friend of mine that's done that, just to let you know. So I know others have done it as well. So if I can recap real quickly, I've, I've got a lot of different sound bites. So I, I'm hearing from you, you know, follow your passions. I heard every concert matters. I, I love, so love that line hearing you know listening to the to your customers and really funnel building and then taking risks and networking with different people any any other last kind of remarks that you'd like to share with the go getters today i would just say you have to i used to be a young go getter then and i think like i would spend so much time you know i would write out my plans and goals and it's really important to do that to have that direction but you have to be flexible right you have to be flexible. You have to be calculating. And I think you all, you know, you have to sort of be able to adapt. And, you know, and I'm not great at this now, I'll just tell you this, but I really think, you know, I've got a, a son, a four year old, and there's something about the time management of having a child that I wish I had when I was earlier before I had a kid. I, you know, I look at my time now and think, God, I had so much time I never realized. I just think you have to literally try to win every single day. Like every day you have to sort of put a brick up on that foundation, you know, that you're trying to build and almost not go to sleep until you feel like you've made some progress. And that's really important or else you're going to look and say, where did that month go? Where did that, you know, three months go? Where did that six months, where did that year go? But if you just find like, I find like if you just, if you have a goal, if you write things out, you know, you start working, you, you sort of lay these bricks, Every now and then you look and say, are my goals right? Is my path right? You kind of tack a little to the left, tack a little bit to the right and keep going. You will begin to build yourself into the person you want to be and the goals that you want to achieve. It'll just, I think it'll happen. You know, my wife always, her grandfather lived to a hundred. He's a black Marine used to say, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I actually really believe that. I would add to that, you have to have some direction. But part of this just is you can't, this is not a game that's one on paper. You got to get out there and be active and do things and try and test and test and test. With that, if, if anyone wanted to get a hold of you, Kofi, what are some of the ways that people can reach out to you? Well, I'm on Admit Me, small plug. They can find me on Admit Me. I'll be your first friend. <laughs> you also can shoot me. That was shameless. You also can shoot me an email, Kofi at admit.me and on Twitter at the real Kof, K-O-F. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty accessible. You can find me or LinkedIn. Although I do scrutinize, you know, LinkedIn a little bit. So no, no solicitation, but no crazy solicitations. But yeah, I'm out there and I, I love to interact and I'm trying to give back the way people gave back to me and pour into my knowledge into other people the way, you know, my elders poured knowledge into me. So it's really important to do that. You know, this was such a great conversation, Kofi. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Misi Muse Unplugged. Oh, awesome. Let me give you a quick plug. So... This is an awesome podcast. I just, you know, I know I talked a little bit before. I'm so proud you're doing this. It takes guts to do this. And I know you sort of, you had to tweak and figure it out on your own. So 
you're definitely a mentor for all the people listening. So props to you for doing that. And thank you so much for including me on your journey. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kofi. And go-getters, if you have a particular question or feedback, feel free to drop us a line, macymuse, unplugged at gmail.com. I'd like to, again, thank Kofi for being a guest on today's show. And thank you, my go-getters, for tuning in today. This is Christy Lindor signing out for the Misi Muse Unplugged pop-up podcast. Here's to your journey to greatness. Tune in every Friday for new episodes syndicated on iTunes, Google Play Music, and many more. Visit www.misimuse.com for more information.